of Descent Show and Tell series. A warm welcome to Marcino Khan, today's speaker. Today's talk is on Belfast and Glasgow anarchism. I'm Stacia, I'm one of the team of volunteers here in Glasgow at the SOAR Archive. Um, I've been asked to chair this today, which I'm very pleased to do. This is our first online Zoom show and tell, and it's thanks to the IWW Clydeside branch for the Zoom and Keith for the hosting. For your interest, this is being recorded. It will be edited and available on the SOAR website pretty soon, I hope. Um, today I'm going to say a wee bit about the archive, It'll probably take about eight minutes, and then I'll introduce Marcino Khan. Then Marcin will talk about Belfast and Glasgow anarchism for a bit, followed by a few prepared questions. During this, you can use the chat button to send Marcin your own question. Um, just keep me right here, Keith. Uh, people stay muted until they put their hand up to ask a question. Yes. Right. Um, and we expect it to be um, around about 90 minutes. Um, today's show and tell is a wee bit restricted by Zoom because it's invitation only. Normally show and tells are with the general public uh, for uh, SOAR, uh, but we took the online opportunity to invite international visitors with an interest in the subject. Um, show and, t uh, and welcome to Mario from Portugal. <laughs> Show and Tell is a series which the Glasgow City Archives invited us to join some years ago. The purpose of it was to invite the general public to meet and revisit archive collections for education and discussion. But the SOAR aims go further. We exist to spread the ideas of anarchism and hope that our 42 collections of dissent will also lead to further agitation and action in changing the system and changing the future. The Show and Tell series is widely advertised on social media and as a newsletter, so watch out for future events. Um, most of you already know about SOAR. Um, we started the Spirit of Revolt Archive nine years ago to preserve and promote anarchist history. We are a small group of 45 members, but our network is much wider. There are other autonomous or anarchist archives in the UK, including the Sparrow's Nest in Nottingham, May Day's Rooms in London, and at the moment they're building an archive around the COVID-19 um, that you can add to. The Autonomous Centre in Edinburgh Library has got some international archive items, which we house in SOR. And there's a new archive we've just heard of that started in Newcastle. Um, there's many others around the world, um, like the Kate Sharpley Library, um, previously a squat, then in Northampton, and I think it's now in California. Um, we're also, as an archive, in contact with Marianne and the team at CIRA in Switzerland, which is the International Research Centre on Anarchism in Lausanne, thanks to Mario. <laughs> They have been collecting and providing access to a multitude of documents on the anarchist movement in all languages for over 60 years. So Spirit of Revolt Archives preserves anarchist and libertarian socialist history, the history of the common people for radical change in our lives. We collect multimedia anarchist materials, mainly local, but also uh, some with international links. These include campaign materials as well as artifacts, films, letters, minutes of meetings, drawings and manuscripts. We hold 14 journal runs, old pamphlets going back to the 1890s, some rare issues of even older books and we have an original music score. We have thousands of items carefully organised and accessible via the website or via the duty archivist in the archives itself. This is radical history and it really matters. It's a record of events internationally marginalized by the state. Someone said that with a knowledge of radical history, you're armed with a weapon. 
The powerful promote their version of events, protecting their vested, vested interests, and the ordinary people have another. If we understand how the past was forged, we can arm ourselves to change the future. We're not alone in thinking this. Many people support this view across the world and understand that unless radical history is collected, preserved and remembered, it's easy for the state propaganda machines, the right and other political groups to reinvent it for us. They marginalize our dissent, they minimize our contribution to events, demonize our actions, hide our existence and write us out. Without anarchist history, it's harder to challenge their distortion of events, their denial of the struggles, or take courage from past methods of action. The Spirit of Revolt, Revolt Group now preserves 42 archives of dissent, and as you can see, it is crucial work. Our aim is to intervene in these distortions of history, make facts available in hard copy. By doing this, SOAR tried to transform the lack of visibility and the denial of existence of libertarian, socialist and anarchist history. As well as the show and tells, SOAR organizes public free exhibitions with duty volunteers to get debates going. We hold social nights of music, poetry, performance, and we run fundraiser events. We've run workshops and produced educational materials. We collaborate a lot with wider anarchist activity. Our evidence is in the archives. It's the story of desperate radical battles in our struggle for a better life. By viewing the things firsthand, we can appreciate the clarity, cleverness, sheer guts and humor in the battles of resistance from ordinary people in the past, and that we, the many, have the power to change the world. We need this history more than ever now. So a wee bit about um, the Spirit of Revolt aims uh, from the start and why we exist has been to bring these ideas within the archive collections to the widest possible audience. All those years ago, we planned to create a hard copy archive locally with a digital archive for universal access. So we chose the Mitchell because it is a public access free reference library. There are small anarchist collections elsewhere in the three Glasgow universities, but with the Mitchell, there are no elite membership barriers, no restriction on readers. The storage is a high standard. It's free and it's not precarious with no overhead costs. Everyone has access. We can remove the entire collection of SOAR if we ever want to, it's in the Mitchell, but not of the Mitchell. Anarchists in the past have deposited collections there, including the Bratuk Du and the Guy Aldred papers. So we're kind of following in a tradition in that respect. Nothing goes into the vaults there until it's been catalogued and scanned by the website. Our single overhead is the cost of the autonomous sessional archivist, whom we need in order to catalog the collections for consistent upload both to the website and to the Mitchell vaults. We're very lucky to have an activist and archivist, Paula Larkin, who specializes in community archives, including the Political Song Collection and Govan Hill Baths. We've got a small team of very dedicated volunteer activists who keep the practical work of the archive going. This includes box listing acquisitions, scanning documents, uploading to the website, preservation, education, designing events and collaborations, publishing, live linking with other archives and answering inquiries. But we know we can pull on a wider network if we need. If any of you like the sound of this and would like more information about SOAR or to become involved and donate your time, we have lists of projects you can choose from some of which can be done from home. If you don't have time, but would like to become our friend, you can use the contact button on the SOAR website and we can keep in touch with you. If you would like to donate money, then use the details on the donate page of the website. Please consider donating and subscribing. We work on a shoestring budget. Um, and after the initial setup, we became fully autonomous with no outside grants or government funding. And we're thankful to all the members for every tiny standing order we can get. A standing order 
the price of a cup of coffee is worth its weight in gold to us because it lets us plan and it gives us a bit of security. But all types of donations are um, important in preserving the radical and anarchist history and support the crucial work of the volunteers. So I hope I've represented the team of volunteers and I've explained the background a wee bit. Um, I'm going to go on now and introduce Marcin. Um, today's show and tell is based on the TSOR number 38 Marcin O'Can collection. The collection includes scans of material relating to the Glasgow Anarchist Group, including correspondence with Robert Lynn, the Scottish Federation of Anarchists, and Frank Leach. Marcino Khan is a senior lecturer in modern Irish history at the University of Central Lancashire in Preston and lives in Derry. He's a member of the Belfast based anarchist group Organise. He was born in 1970 in Govan and grew up in Halfway, Campus Lang, and then Irvine in Ayrshire before going to study at the University of Ulster's McGee College campus in Derry in 1994. Marcin vis uh, finished his studies in 2001 and he worked in various research centres until getting the job at his current university in 2007. His main areas of research cover the history of the Irish community in Scotland, aspects of Irish and Scottish labour history, including anarchist history and oral history. Amongst other work, Marcin is the author of A Wee Black Book of Belfast Anarchism, 1867-1973, and With a Bent Elbow and a Clenched Fist, A Brief History of the Glasgow Anarchists. Today's focus for Marcin is on Belfast and Glasgow Anarchism. Um, so today's format is a short contribution followed by question and answer. We have several questions ready set, but you can send your own question to Machine during the event. Either type it into the uh, chat button or um, put your hand up and Keith can uh, give you access. Um, so then we can open it up for discussion. I hope that suits everybody. Um, so Machine. Uh, that's all from me, I think. So, um, how are you doing over there? Okay, oh, no bother. Um, so, I'll load up my slides. I think um, Keith will need to kind of give me over a bit of control just momentarily for me to share my screen. I think you sh you should be able to just go for it, machine. Uh, all right, I'll give it a go then. Why? Okie doke. Um, hopefully this won't be deaf by PowerPoint. <laughs> um, I don't have too many slides. I only intend to speak for... Can everybody see them okay? Let's put it on the main... Can everybody see that? Hopefully, yeah. Um, well, oh, hopefully, speak for about 15 to 20 minutes, I think. And this is really just an overview that should collect together um, some of the some of the stuff that I've looked at over over a long number of years ago now really so it's kind of hard been hard trying to refresh my memory in some of this um stuff I'd like to thank obviously uh, Clydeside IWW and the Spirit of Revolt Archives for um, inviting me to give this and the hard work put in by Stacia who gave the uh, introduction there and, and uh, Keith as well um, and also John Cousin um, uh, who's been really interesting to meet over the past year or two and um, and to get to know a little bit. Um, so I thought as I say I'll just I'll just give give you an overview really. Um, I kind of based this loosely around a, a seminar paper that I gave to my colleagues um, at the University of Central Lancashire probably about eight or nine years ago now which was called, I think I called it for, um, Last Orders at the Hangman's Rest, which was a reference to this pub, the Hangman's Rest in Glasgow, um, which is no longer there, um, where anarchists used to meet in, I think, the late 40s and 1950s, predominantly. Um, I know about it largely because of Keith, 
there, uh, Keith work that he did there uh, was involved with um, in doing a series of oh, history interviews with some returned Glasgow anarchist veterans in the uh, sort of late 1980s. Um, uh, the Raysides, uh, Molly Baird, um, some of you might have come across that um, online, very valuable, invaluable um, work really, it has to be said. And in the course of those interviews, they mentioned that the Hangman's Rest was one of the places that they used to meet, one of the less salubrious places that um, Glasgow anarchists at that time used to meet in. I think Molly Baird said, uh, if there was a lull in the conversation, you know, the rats would kind of come out from <laughs> under the floorboards. Um, so, uh, but it was difficult, it was always kind of difficult, obviously, for anarchists, and particularly in earlier decades, to kind of find um, meeting places. Um, and uh, a lot of places just wouldn't wouldn't have their name associated with, with, with anarchy and anarchism, so anarchists were forced to meet in a lot of kind of strange and unusual places. I mean, Stuart Christie and his, um, my granny made me an anarchist book, is quite good at covering this even into the 1960s, um, when anarchists were still sort of, um, they were kind of meeting sometimes even in each other's houses. Um, so, uh, and then the other picture relates to um, the sort of Belfast side of things, um, and it's a picture from uh, just books, um, I think from the late 1970s, um, I'm not entirely sure, so you might correct me on that, but um, which was a kind of an anarchist kind of social centre and bookshop in Belfast. They really kind of helped kickstart anarchism um, from a kind of the low point that it had reached by the 1970s um, with the onset of the, the conflict in Northern Ireland, um, when most sort of kind of radical and kind of left-wing activity was sort of kind of pushed pushed to the margins a little bit as the as the kind of conflict there gained in intensity and Belfast City Centre for many years was certainly an unsafe place for for most people. Um, so that that's kind of tight to explain really the two photographs there. So the purpose of the talk, um, if you can see that okay, um, is to establish the parameters of an anarchist tradition in Glasgow and Belfast, I outline some of the politics of the movement, um, the linkages between the, the two cities, um, and I guess try and place the anarchists in some kind of wider, in, in some kind of context of the wider labour movement, um, and as much as can do that with a limited kind of talk like this. Okay, um, so uh, Glasgow is really kind of where to begin because um, the research that I had done um, show, showed really that um, the anarchism probably developed first on, uh, firstly in Glasgow um, and a little bit later um, in Belfast. Um, there is a story um, that I discovered in, in kind of the early stages of my research years ago about this um, Scottish engineer called, presumably called um, Duncan Dundonald, um, or Duncan Donald as he was sometimes called. Um, who is supposed to have helped translate um, Nekayev's Catechism of a Revolutionist from 1869 into English um, and been involved in very early anarchist movements prior to the, co the Commune. Um, but, um, and then subsequently he is meant to have gone to Australia. But I couldn't really find much more in the way of hard evidence about him. And over the years, I've kind of become a bit sceptical about um, the entire story. Um, there are older kind of linkages um, that go back into the kind of mid 19th century, um, particularly John Henry Mackay from, from um, Greenock, um, who had links with um, who had links with German idealist um, German idealists philosophical school, which get influenced um, anarchists, some early anarchists anyway. Um, and uh, one or two other kind of small linkages. Um, but generally speaking, a bit like Ireland in many cases, a lot of the people that were involved early on, um, uh, or people that came from Scotland or Ireland uh, and got involved with anarchism, tended to have more of an influence outside of the countries in which they were born. Um, 
And I was always more kind of focused on bringing it back to looking at Glasgow, bringing it back to you know, looking at Belfast, to the people that, that remain behind and as much as, as, as some of them did, they were much more difficult to find. And much of the early kind of research points towards a couple called Fred and Amy MacDonald um, as the original sort of first anarchist speakers in Glasgow. Um, and uh, Amy MacDonald, as far as we know, was a <coughs> Scottish woman and uh, her partner, Fred, who unusually for the time um, uh, appears to have taken her name um, rather than rather than um, keep his own or give her his name uh, in the more conventional style. Um, and he was a, there are two different or conflicting notions that he was a, I think we're fairly certain he was a baker, um, that he was a refugee from the Paris Commune where he'd been involved in the Commune, involved in the uprising, Commune Arts uprising, and um, was a left-leaning revolutionary um, anarchist, left-leaning or revolutionary anarchist, I'm not sure whether the anarchism came later, but I think when he arrived in Glasgow, he certainly had, um, had anarchist um, ideals. Uh, and he met this woman named MacDonald, and they started a public speaking pitch on Glasgow Green, uh, which was kind of famous um, throughout this period, and well into the 20th century for having a free speaking pitch. It's actually two main ones, one um, in Glasgow Green itself, which is kind of large kind of public park area that some of you most of may be familiar with, um, and another area called um, the Jail Square, um, just one of the entrances really to Glasgow Green, um, which I think nowadays is called Jocelyn Square, sort of renamed um, at some point. Uh, just across from the, I think it's the city mortuary is sort of kind of faces it there. Um, and that was a public speaking pitch as well. And so from this early stages, you know, we're talking really from the 1870s, um, McDonald's um, were active in public speaking, uh, we don't know if they sold anarchist propaganda. It may have been that it was just a sort of um, an oral activism, if you like, really, you know, public speech uh, and stuff like that to try and rally people. Um, so they, they were sort of kind of plugging away over the years. I forgot to say there's another, there's two takes of, on McDonald himself. One says that he was a, a German um, baker, and the other one says that he was a French baker. <laughs> um, so I haven't kind of quite got to the bottom of that, but it's one of the things that I intend to kind of look at over the kind of next few months, really, and try and revise some of this research and get it published. Um, so then there's a bit of a kind of there's a bit of hiatus really until um, until the emergence of the Social Democratic Federation in the 1880s. Um, and the visit of um, Peter Kropotkin um, to the city um, uh, for the first time, I think, in 1886. He visited a couple of times. Um, and largely under the auspices of the Socialist League, which was a more anarchist inclined, um, or certainly a more anti-parliamentarian inclined um, uh, organisation that more or less broke away from the Social Democratic Federation, which is the kind of main early Marxist organisation in the 1880s in Britain. Um, and Kirpokin's visit led to a, 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 a great increase in, in anarchism as an idea. Um, and maybe there had already been some sort of fertile soil there because of the activism of the McDonald's really into which um, Kropotkin was, was able to kind of feed. And his visit was kind of followed up um, by a visit uh, from uh, a widow of one of the Chicago martyrs, the Haymarket martyrs. Um, uh, those men executed um, after the Haymarket affair that led to the birth of May Day and as an international workers' day. Um, and that was just a year after um, uh, Lucy Parsons, after 1887 and the whole Haymarket affair, when uh, Albert Parsons' widow, um, Lucy Parsons, visited in 1888, and again, sort of revived kind of notions about um, anarchism and and generated a lot more interest and support of it. And this kind of remarked at this time that the Socialist League 
branch in Glasgow was was fairly kind of firmly um, anti, certainly anti-parliamentarian um, in its kind of revolutionary socialist tradition, maybe rather than explicitly anarchist at this time. Um, but certainly there was a growing awareness um, in Glasgow uh, at this time of, of anarchism, it was spoken about, it was known about, and people were aligning themselves uh, with with this kind of new, um, this new movement, really. Um, looking at kind of Belfast, it's slightly kind of different, really. Um, while obviously the early um, socialist movement um, from certainly in the 1880s um, had made some impact on Ireland um, as a whole, uh, and there had, there had been actually some sort of anarchist group that emerged um, in Dublin in the 1880s. Belfast was slightly different. And of course, Belfast in the 1880s was a place that was completely dominated in many ways, um, as it would be for many years afterwards, up to the present day, the sort of nationalist in politics, um, Irish nationalism versus um, Ulster um, or Irish unionism, um, which was really just a, a, a variation of British um, nationalism, essentially. Um, so you had these two nationalists, um, national claims, if you like, um, fighting it out um, in the 1880s. And the major riots in Belfast in 1886, um, a number of people were killed um, uh, as a result of these riots, really, that clearly kind of divided the Belfast working class. Um, and um, it seemed probably at that time that there wasn't a great deal of space for for non-sectarian working class politics um, to develop, or socialist politics to develop in any sense. Um, but there were a few individuals nonetheless that kind of emerged. One that I kind of became aware of probably only over the last um, five to six years was uh, a Tolstoyan, um, and you can see an advert here for his newspaper, um, Brotherhood, which continued for many, many years. I think he founded it in the 18, late 1880s, I think, um, and it continued right on until till he died in 1939. Although it wasn't very well known about it in a very small circulation, it was always left leaning, openly kind of socialist, um, and always inclined to um, be supportive of, of anarchists and interested in anarchist ideas. The man behind it, it says, was John Bruce Wallace. He had an unusual background from Limavady, um, small town um, uh, on the kind of western Northern Ireland near Derry here, um, and he was uh, he was a minister um, originally Presbyterian, but he broke with the Presbyterians um, because he felt that they were um, that they weren't suitably um, radical enough in one way or another, socially radical, and he went towards the Congregationalists. Um, uh, who he found much more tolerant of a kind of wider variety of kind of ideas and stuff. So he was a sort of Christian socialist, you know, but I think ultimately really a Tolstoyan, really. I think that sort of Christian anarchist tradition really was one that appealed to Wallace and one about which he spoke spoke about, you know, as, as one that, in which he saw himself as fitting. Um, so the newspaper was his voice, and he, I suppose, first began to speak about um, Kropotkin writings in the 1880s and began to kind of publicise these and popularise them a little bit. He also, interestingly, I found out this recently, but he um, he went to, uh, as a defence witness, um, in one of the big anarchist trials of the 1890s and spoke um, in support um, in London. Um, spoke in support of of, um, of the anarchist activists who, who had been arrested. Um, and so he, he was willing to kind of stick his neck out, really, at a time, you know, when they're kind of a clamouring, if you like, particularly in the wake of Haymarket, for, you know, this sort of demonisation of, of anarchism as an idea, uh, or of anarchist activists in particular. Um, he was willing to kind of stand up to that, really, you know. Um, so I've got a lot more to kind of look at him. William Bailey um, was Belfast-born um, a basket maker um, 
and he doesn't really make much of an imprint in Belfast itself. I'm not sure if he came into contact with Wallace or Wallace's ideas, but certainly by the time he uh, migrated to Manchester in the 1880s, he has become a kind of fully fledged anarchist communist. Uh, he's involved with the Socialist League, that a, a broad sort of kind of a broad based kind of umbrella socialist movement, uh, which as I said was mainly anarchist in kind of Glasgow, um, or certainly anti parliamentarian and had elements of that in the Manchester branch. Um, and a uh, Bailey corresponded with Kropotkin. Um, he was an, a, a very active and energetic um, activist in Manchester. Um, and then he emigrates, he goes to America, where he comes under the kind of uh, uh, nefarious, as some would see it, influence of um, Tucker and the individualist anarchist, um, American individualist anarchist tradition there. Um, although he still, I think, and I kind of maintained this when I wrote about him, I think he still, if you look at the body of his writing in general, you can kind of see that um, he has ma he managed in the US to kind of fuse his early anarchist communism with some of the kind of American individualist anarchist tradition. He writes an, an awful lot about, about and gets involved in workplace struggle, you know. Um, he doesn't simply um, uh, get involved in, in sort of purely, um, you know, cultural anarchist sort of individualist um, lifestyle, if you like. He, he actually actively gets involved in class struggle anarchism as well. So I think he kind of maintained that interest. Um, I think my, my thinking at the moment is that, that both Wallace and Bailey kind of came out of a sort of radical liberal kind of tradition, I think probably in the 1880s that was increasingly turning away from that radical liberal tradition and towards, um, towards socialism. Um, at a time when socialism hadn't fully settled on a kind of parliamentary um, path um, forward. Um, and two bodies that, that certainly uh, Wallace was involved with, with um, uh, well, the Belfast Radical Association and the Belfast Clarion Club, groups that had sort of overlapping leadership in a lot of ways and um, were increasingly sort of um, engaged in, um, in anarchist, um, oh, sorry, and um, anti kind of parliamentarian um, uh, sort of kind of talks and, and would have invited people to kind of come to give talks in Belfast of a kind of an anarchist nature. I think so, I always thought that some of the early anarchist speakers who came to Belfast um, came as a result of an invitation from these groups, but I kind of found out more recently that that wasn't actually the case. So if we can swing back um, to looking at Glasgow, we're running on with time here, so I'll try and run through it. Um, so as I said, in Glasgow we had the Socialist League um, anarchists um, in the 1890s. Um, we don't know uh, an awful lot um, about them, um, but eventually they evolved into the earliest Glasgow anarchist group, which seems to have emerged in 1892. Um, and I mean, thankfully, freedom um, in newspaper, the British anarchist newspaper, has uh, digitised a lot of the material over the last, um, I think, only over the last year or two, um, and that's online and makes looking at this early period much much easier. Um, so, I know there was a small group there. We don't know too much about them. Um, that early eighteen nineties Glasgow anarchist group. Um, but uh, they involved a, a number of kind of different um, individuals. The ones that we do know about were the Duff um, uh, couple, uh, man, and, man and his partner, uh, his companion, who were very active in the in this in the setting up of this early group, and they brought. Um, Walterine Declare, the American anarchist speaker, to the city to speak on, on a couple of occasions. And she used the opportunity to go on tours of the Highlands and the great love of Scotland as a kind of place, um, as well as um, being involved in, in anarchist propaganda in the city. Um, and 
The group sort of kind of lingered on until the early 1900s. I have a kind of small piece. There was a newspaper um, report that was done on um, local journalists went along. It's a very scurrilous, typically scurrilous piece of, you know, tabloid yellow press journalism, as it was called, of, of, of the time. Um, having a go really at, at, at these desperados who were who were in, in the midst of ordinary happy kind of Glaswegians um, perpetrating um, revolutionary um, deeds and so on. Um, the, co the, the piece here is quite interesting because the journalist that wrote it had gone along to a meeting. He said there were only 15 people at that meeting and he describes them as this. He says the Glasgow anarchists who on this particular occasion that he had, you know, gone, gone to for this meeting, um, were mustered at their full strength, um, did not number more than 15 people. There were some Scottish, some Irish, but the majority were Italian um, and also Polish Jews, um, driven through the ferocity and wickedness of the rulers of their native country to seek refuge elsewhere. Of the 15, three were women and they too were foreigners, as he called them. Um, and, and, you know, this is a kind of common trope at the time, this idea, you know, of um, dastardly, um, usually mustachioed, uh, <laughs> uh, Eastern European um, and Russian um, exiles in one way or another. A plotting revolution in, in British cities, really. So they were kind of playing on a sort of kind of idea that was kind of around there anyway, um, and play, playing to that kind of notion. But I, I think it's nonetheless interesting. And if you look in other places, you kind of see that it, it tends to be revolutionary exiles from other countries who are, who are who make up a lot of kind of the early anarchist groups, really. So um, it's a, it was interesting that and something I kind of want to look at in a bit more detail and try and track down some of the people themselves who have kind of forgotten to, to history. Um, so there is a there is a bit of kind of reawakening of anarchism in Glasgow, I would say around about 1905-1906. And um, but it's small and it doesn't really it a bit like the 1890s group in Glasgow, they're they're very easily kind of marginalized. Um, uh, by the by, the state they're monitored um, regularly by the police, and um, and I think really well they continue the, the 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 public speaking and so on that, and they kind of tell pamphlets and newspapers. Um, they they don't have an awful lot of kind of growth, I don't think, throughout this period until um, the arrival um, within about I think a year of each other of George Barrett. Um, a, an anarchist from Bristol, um, and Guy Aldred, um, more famously pictured both um, at the bottom there. Then about 1912, around about then, 1911, 1912. Um, and then they both become very active in uh, forming uh, the Glasgow Anarchist Group and the Glasgow um, Communist Group, um, respectively. Barrett, more aligned with the early Glasgow Anarchist Group, and um, Aldred with the Glasgow Communist Group. Well, these two groups seem to become interchangeable. And I think it's John Taylor Caldwell claimed that they, they actually um, merge in 1916 um, uh, because really the differences between them are, are so slight, really. Um, and you can see that photograph there, some of the, that famous photograph of some of the Glasgow anarchists um, uh, from, I think, 1915 or something like that. Um, so, uh, so th th those kind of groups kind of grow um, uh, and become very active during the era that's known as Red Clydeside. This is follows a period of great labour period of unrest um, from about 1910 right through to 1914 from before the war and that sort of rise in kind of militancy um, carries on into the, the first years of the First World War, particularly with the, the rise of the syndicalist movement. Um, popularity of the IWW in the US and elsewhere, um, has, uh, and also the influence of French syndicalism um, has led to the growth of this um, uh, out of the sort of um, 
out of the industrial kind of unionist kind of movement um, of the early early 20th century as well, going into the First World War. And we'll get things like the Clyde Workers Committee, which is holds its meetings in, in um, uh, uh, if I can remember, <laughs> um, in a bookshop sort of kind of attached to the Clarion Movement, which in itself um, is sort of run by William McGill, who's a, an early Glasgow anarchist. And on the committee as well, we have a, there are a couple of anarchists involved, despite the fact that an awful lot of labour history has sort of written out, tended historically to be quite kind of Marxist inclined when it was being written in the 1970s and the 1980s and onwards, in fact. And it tends to write out um, the anarchist um, contribution to Red Clyde side and to that, um, that kind of momentous kind of period in, in Glasgow's kind of labour history. It tends to be seen as purely a, a Marxist, um, a, a kind of mainstream kind of socialist sort of kind of movement without an anarchist component to it, but it was nonetheless there. In fact, one of the leading um, Glasgow um, socialists and later Republicans, um, John McLean, was arrested with um, and imprisoned with an anarchist um, engineer um, who uh, worked with him, a guy called Jack Smith, I think his name. Um, so so that, that, that involvement was there. The anarchists were involved in anti-militarist work and resisting the introduction of conscription. They then became, uh, they worked against the, uh, the imposition of the Munitions Act as well. Um, uh, uh, were involved in the kind of growing syndicalist movement that was around them in a very kind of non-sectarian um, way, in spite of the fact that there were differences from time to time as well, um, and played a kind of full and active kind of part in that. After the Russian Revolution, um, things slowly began to peel apart again, and well, anarchists and communists kind of worked together um, up until about 1919, um, with uh, increasing appearance of a dictatorial um, a regime in the Soviet Union, um, those, those, those kind of formally united kind of forces began, a revolutionary forces began to kind of pull apart again um, and the Glasgow anarchists sort of kind of emerged along with their, or merged themselves into the anti-parliamentary um, communist federation. Um, the APCF or the anti panties as they were nicknamed, um, that emerged in the 1920s. So, um, switching back um, quickly um, to Belfast, um, John McCara um, is, seems to be the first guy who you know, visits the city, he's active there, and it's through his influence that an early anarchist uh, movement um, or organisation um, emerges in, in the city. Um, probably, you know, certainly one there round about the time of his arrest um, in 1908 um, for making what the police judged to be a seditious speech. Um, it was a comment on the assassination of the King of Portugal, um, but um, he had said, you know, if the, if the British king behaved like the king of Portugal, then he too probably would, would, would be facing assassination. Um, and the, the police at the time took this to be a, an encouragement for people to assassinate the British king, King George. And, and he, was, um, he was arrested and he served a few months in Belfast prison. And all sort of kind of to support them. Um, George Barrett, who I didn't know this until recently, the famous Glasgow anarchist speaker, who was originally from Bristol, also came to Belfast at this time, um, uh, I think on at least two occasions, um, and tried to kind of pick up where Macara had kind of left off, in a sense. Macara had originally, got, he was a cork cutter to trade, um, and they'd originally gone there for work. Um, and just got involved in anarchist um, propaganda when he was there. Um, he sold freedom and other anarchist pamphlets, and he spoke from the custom house steps, um, which has become again, interestingly, has become a kind of public space that's sort of utilised by Belfast City Council, um, mainly for kind of entertainment, music events, and things like that, um, but was a very 
well known it's quite close to the docks and quite close to the factories in the city um, and became a famous public speaking pitch a bit like Glasgow Green was in many ways um, so Makara and Barrett both spoke there and gathered uh, gathered to themselves a small a small group of kind of um, Belfast uh, anarchists a guy called Joseph Webb um, another guy called Richard Stubbs who um, created a bit of controversy in the pages of freedom um, in arguing really against industrial unionism that, that, that anarchists um, shouldn't be drawn uh, into industrial unionist um, activities or syndicalist kind of activities really. Um, and that to, to, there was a to and fro um, in the pages of freedom um, about that. Um, about that sort of kind of argument. So there is a small group there. It's difficult to know how big it is. Um, it's probably much, much smaller than Glasgow. We can say that with some certainty, given that, that Belfast was still in the grip of these sort of kind of sectarian um, arguments in many ways over, um, over a, a kind of future, you know, state, if you like, or future constitutional arrangements of Ireland in general. Um, but nonetheless, there was a small left there, and the anarchists um, were there as well. And, and, and it's something that I need to kind of really research a bit more. So, in terms of later anarchist groups, I mentioned the Anti Parliamentary Communist Federation in Glasgow, um, which becomes kind of synonymous in many ways with Frank Leach, um, who was another English anarchist who came um, north after the First World War, it seems. He was demobbed from the Royal Navy where he'd been a, a boxing champion. And um, he gets involved with the Anti-Parliamentary Communist Federation in Glasgow. Um, he has a shop, um, famously, um, and he's able, obviously, some of that, some of the money from that helps kind of finance their activities over the years. Um, and Guy Aldred's um, Trajectory is a bit different. Obviously, he founds the United Socialist Movement um, in the 1930s that breaks away from the APCF in which he was involved. And there is clearly a bit of a kind of personality clash between himself and, and Leach. Um, but I think th the politics are sort of kind of slightly different, really, um, in some ways um, as well. Um, Aldred, sort of, um, both very good public speakers. Um, uh, but um, Aldred, probably the, the, the much better known individual, um, but had the tactic of standing in elections on an abstentionist ticket, uh, what he called the Sinn Féin strategy after the early Irish um, nationalist kind of party, um, uh, which was kind of unusual, obviously, for, for, for an anarchist. Um, and he, he very specifically avoided um, reference to to anarchism and used, you know, in terms of the title of his, the organisation that they founded and calling it the United Socialist Movement. Um, the APCF people tended to have kind of moved towards the Glasgow Anarchist Communist Federation later on. And then there was a kind of a sprinkling of different organisations, the Workers' Open Forum, the Marxian um, uh, Discussion Forum as well. Um, and uh, obviously, the years of the, the Spanish Revolution kind of led to a kind of rise in an interest in, in anarchism. Um, and as, as in Ireland, um, there were people who went to fight in Spain, um, not as part of the international brigades, um, or even if they did, it was only initially, um, because it was there that they began to develop, um, if they hadn't developed them already, sort of anarchist um, and libertarian kind of politics. Um, some of those people came back and that sort of kind of fed back into the kind of growth or the sustenance at least of a kind of anarchist movement right throughout um, the Second World War and on into um, years after. Um, Bobby Lynn, uh, who was kind of mentioned earlier, um, emerges out of the apprentice strike um, in the Second World War and, um, uh, and years after it and he is heavily involved in, in, in anarchist activism, as many people will know, over the years. Um, and was one of the first people I kind of was in contact with myself when I got an interest in anarchism. Um, 
in my in sort of 18, 19, around about that age um, as well. And obviously I used to do bus runs and different things, organised at Anakin Summer School every year, which was very successful. Um, they were kind of more famous, obviously, for developing this fusion of anarcho-syndicalism with individualist Sturmerite um, anarchism, uh, which was unusual, unique probably, um, in a lot of ways. Um, and not everyone sort of kind of um, uh, followed that, you know, or supported that sort of kind of fusion of what were essentially, for many people, contradictory forces, you know, extreme individualism alongside um, alongside um, sort of anarcho kind of syndicalism or anarcho communism. Um, and a number of people left that and came across one individual who was an Italian um, Glasgow or born in Greenock originally, Stephen Marletta, um, who was a physiotherapist and he'd been involved with the Glasgow anarchists um, in the 1940s and 50s and then he he, he was pulled more by the Stormerite individualist anarchist tradition and eventually um, got involved with the egoist and Sid Parker, based in London, um, and became a conscious egoist in the Stormerite kind of tradition. Um, I'm not sure how many others from Glasgow would have followed that tradition, but it was certainly always there, and I think probably kind of quite strong, strong enough anyway, to kind of pull people um, along with it. Um, so maybe I'll look at Belfast. There are individuals, say, during the Spanish Civil War, um, James Campbell here in Derry, um, who's arrested by um, Stalinist authorities in Spain, suspected of what they refer to as Trotskyist or anarchist sympathies. Um, uh, there's obviously Jack White, um, who I haven't mentioned, um, uh, who, again, a complicated kind of figure in a lot of ways, but certainly um, was involved and inspired by um, anarchism in Spain and uh, and, and maintained an interest in, in anarchism right up to his death, but didn't, didn't leave anything in terms of kind of organisational anarchist um, movement kind of behind when he, when he went. Um, in the 1930s was a figure called uh, um, anti-slum housing activist called Jack uh, McMullen or Slum Dumb Jack, as he was known as, who had a, an interest in support for anarchism um, in the kind of radical period of the 1930s. Um, but really, nothing seems to kind of last or develop in terms of an actual group again until the 1960s, when the Belfast Anarchist Group um, emerges out of the sort of kind of rise, if you like, in, in, in anarchist politics and you know, radical politics generally, internationally at that time. Um, and I guess uh, an early member of that who becomes quite well known is John McGuffin, who I've kind of written a bit about, um, who ended up here in Derry. Um, and uh, John uh, sort of kind of broke away really from the early um, Belfast um, anarchist group um, to become more supportive of the Irish Republican struggle um, and kind of well maintaining sort of anarchist politics in a sense, um, put an awful lot of his time and energy into, um, into the kind of wider Republican, um, Irish Republican struggle. Um, uh, but was a kind of, you know, for many years was seen as sort of kind of main figure really in, in Belfast anarchism. The Belfast anarchist cells then sort of for various reasons kind of split apart and became the Belfast Libertarian Group and they disappeared really in the 1970s under the threat that they received from some of the paramilitary organisations, both Republican and Loyalist, um, to sort of cease and desist their, their activities. Um, and it wasn't really until the later 70s with the emergence of Just Books that we kind of began to see a revived anarchist movement in, 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 um, in Belfast again. Um, very cautiously, if you like, kind of emerging to try and argue for that what was going on in Belfast in the 1970s was very far removed from anarchism, was very far removed from an actual struggle for liberation. Um, that actually it was the same old kind of competing sectarian nationalisms that weren't in any way um, going to lead to the liberation of the working class for any kind of true kind of freedom or equality, really. Um, 
and they can applaud that kind of lonely follow really um, up to the present day in, in many ways. Um, and various anarchist groups have kind of come and gone um, over the years as a kind of result of that, but it still kind of remains a tradition that is there. And obviously, the you know, as in Glasgow and other places, the emergence of punk um, gave a kind of boost to these movements and helped them on, on, on their way really and brought, brought a kind of new wave of of people towards anarchism and anarchist ideas, really. Um, sorry if that's um, a bit of a kind of rambling and shambolic um, introduction, but um, uh, hopefully it, it, it's got some interest, interesting nuggets in it there and doesn't just rehash um, what, I've already, um, what I've already looked at. I'll try and see if I can stop sharing. <laughs> well, thanks very much, Marcin. That was really interesting. There was loads of names in there that I hadn't come across before. Um, right. Yeah. Uh, so, will we go into the questions, or is that what we want to do next? Yep, that's fine by me. If you want, um, Femdis Gavin, maybe want to say first of all, or yeah, um, anything want to come back on all that information because there was so much there a lot of digest uh, you know that so. so is it i t i m m has a question or a yeah uh, ian <laughs> ian yeah, Kai. yeah. Um, uh, thanks that was, that, was, that was very interesting um i was surprised that you didn't mention wally gallagher um, in terms of the Glasgow Anarchist Group, because he was associated with the, the group in the 1910s, and yeah. the as well as, the, I think, the Socialist League? No, no, the Socialist Labour Party. Yeah. Um, and he was involved with the Anarchist Group as well. I remember reading an um, uh, article by, in Freedom in the 1940s, I think it might have been Frank Leach, basically t ripping the piss out of him by contrasting his pre- War ideas with um, his current style and this sort of ramblings, which was quite funny. So I was surprised this, um, you know, you didn't mention him because he was obviously one of the leading anti parliamentarian communists as well. And Lenin had a go at him and left wing communism. Um, and I think anybody's interested, um, if you read his memoirs, Gallagher's memoirs, the reason why he rejected anti parliamentarian communism is because he met with Lenin. And then he said, Comrade Gallagher, why are you against standing in Parliament? And Gallagher goes, well, become, because, you know, people get elected, become corrupted and become part of the system and so forth. And Lenin said, Comrade Gallagher, if you got elected to Parliament, would you become corrupted? And he said, no, I wouldn't. And that, and that is literally the argument he recounted in his memoirs about why he became a parliamentarian communist. Um, which was quite staggering in its naivety, I have, I, I thought. Um, but I thought, as I said, I thought it was quite surprising that Gallagher's name wasn't mentioned because he considered his role he played in the Pride Workers Committee. I know that's fair comment, Ian, thanks. Um, I should have mentioned him, of course. I'd, I mean, there's a whole kind of long list of kind of people really who, who were involved with anarchism temporarily in, in Clydeside, who then kind of later spent spent a life sort of trying to disentangle themselves for that uh, involvement. Manny Shinwell was another one. Um, uh, Gallagher, uh, John Patton, um, there's quite a few of them um, who went on later get involved with the Communist Party like Gallagher. Um, that explanation actually, I remember I had a tape uh, in that somewhere in the house that I got years ago from John Taylor Caldwell where he, he told me just that, that same um, explanation for why Gallagher, um, why Gallagher uh, jumped ship, um, if you like, and then come back and tried to kind of um, sell that to the rest of the Glasgow left, really, in one way or another. <laughs> um, so, and as fair comment, I should have, I should have kind of mentioned that, um, because obviously he is such a kind of prominent kind of individual. But um, there is there does seem to be quite a long tradition of that, can right back to the early the early twentieth century of people then writing their memoirs later on saying I was involved with the anarchists and you know, 
it's a bit like Alcoholics Anonymous. They feel they've got to kind of distance themselves from their, their former activities and apologise, you know, the seventh step or whatever it is, you know. <laughs> yeah, when I was doing the um, George Barrett anthology for Freedom um, a couple of years ago, there was a guy who was a, he eventually became a Labour MP who yeah. was he got convinced of anarchism by hearing Barrett speak in Glasgow. And um, he was basically quite apologetic in, the, in his memoirs about why he eventually rejoined the um, the parliamentarians. But it was quite interesting that um, sort of he's yet another famous or quasi famous Labour MP who goes, "Oh, actually, I was an anarchist once." Yeah, <laughs> I was a teenage anarchist. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> uh, it was a bit like that, you know. Mm. Um, but no, I should have kind of, I should have kind of covered that. I'm sorry, but I'm kind of missing out there. The Gallagher story. Mm. Oh, I think it's hilarious. Yeah, myself. Has, when I read it in his memoirs, I just bust out laughing because yeah. it's like, how how stupid can you get? That's not an argument. Yeah, nobody exactly. goes and nobody goes. I'm going to get corrupted. That's why I'm standing for Parliament. <laughs> well, very few. <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah. thanks. As I say, um, um, I'm just surprised. Yeah, but can kind of thanks for your own work all the years. I've kind of. I'm kind of always an avid, avid reader of the stuff you've kind of produced and that you produce some really amazing and really valuable stuff. Um, I have your Proton book, which is brilliant. Oh, thanks very much. Yep. I encourage anybody else to read it as well because it's, it's excellent. And the Barrett book's brilliant. I have, his I have actually have got George Barrett's pamphlets, which mm. I uh, took photographs years ago in, in the Working Class Movement Library in Salford. I just need to fi find a way to kind of, I think Paul Larkin, the archivist, Spirit and Hope Archive, Suggested some ways because they're big, big files mm. of trying to get get the actual pamphlets back well, into the archive. You know, I some think, of the pamphlets. I think we've got three of the pamphlets. All right, all right. Some of the pamphlets are on uh, are online as PDFs, the actual original scans right. of the nineteen ten ones. So they are available uh, already online. Some of them, not all of them. Right. Mm. Mm. It's good to know. Anybody else want to come in with uh, any feedback or questions? Or yeah. Susan? You need to unmute. That's you. Okay. Uh, I would like to ask. Um, Martin? Yes. Um, I came, this is a question that came to me just one morning as I was waking up and I said, I said, must have been dreaming about this uh, forum because it seems to you to be a scholar. Yeah, um, uh, it's, it's kind of funny I saw that question. I don't really, I don't really consider myself a scholar, to be honest. And I think anybody that's worked in a British university in the last 20 years probably would struggle in some ways to kind of think of themselves first and foremost as that. Especially if, like me, you had years and years of temporary contract work and picked up and dropped um, at the work, um, the managers of the university in one way or another. Um, it's very hard to kind of feel that, really, you know. Um, I, I just tend to think of myself as a worker, you know, predominantly. I was the first in my family to go to university. Um, still, I still am the only person in my family who got to university. My dad always had this idea about, you know, he couldn't really greatly see the point of it because it was not manual work. I'm the first member of my family not to, not to earn, my, earn my bread, if you like, without using my hands. Um, so uh, going into it, I didn't really kind of know what to expect. And I suppose in some ways, like a lot of people, I was only ever interested really in kind of digging around and kind of doing doing the research and different things, and you kind of follow your research interests, mm -hmm. and that kind of got me into it really. I was lucky as enough to get, I was lucky enough to be one of the last people to get a, um, to get a, a, a maintenance grant really from the Scottish um, Grants Awarding Body way back in the nineteen nineties, and that allowed me to kind of pursue a PhD. And then after that, you know, you saw, I get offered bits and pieces of kind of teaching, which I wasn't really interested in doing, to be honest, because um, I really just wanted to do the research. But 
kind of like a lot of people, you kind of realise fairly quickly that um, in higher education anyway, that if you want to do the research, you've got to kind of do the teaching really, you know, the two are become inseparable. Over time, I, I, I go to enjoy the teaching and, and I get an awful lot out, out of it now, really, you know, because um, you learn as much in the process um, as anything else, really, you know, but I don't really, I don't really think of myself as a scholar, I have to say. It's just really, um, you know, I have, I have my research interests and you try and leave an imprint always, you know, in what you write. Um, because you know there's nothing after this really, so <laughs> at least if you write something down, you know, you leave something behind you, don't you know? So I suppose there's a bit of that. And I always think the historians in particular should be able to contribute to the communities they've come from in one way, you know? Um, so in the first instance for me that was to contribute, someone who was from a Glasgow Irish background was to try and contribute to the history of the community that I came from, um, the working class, um, Irish um, uh, immigrant kind of background really so I wanted to write about that um, in some way and then you know latterly obviously um, or, or later on I suppose I got the interest really in trying to do a bit of research into anarchist history because there wasn't much out there really just trying to bring together what other people have written in a sense I suppose as much as anything else um, and so um, that that's so what, what has kind of kept me going on it. I mean, I had I started I started actually kind of working in university in two thousand and one, really after I got my PhD, and it was what part time six month contracts. Then you'd be laid off. So the sort of precarious type of kind of work that that, that you get in so many kind of areas has is, is become a firm feature in universities, really. Um, so as many as so I'm sure are aware. Um, so uh, I only really get a proper contract, although they call it indefinite, which is not quite the same as permanent, I think. <laughs> um, uh, in 2000 and 2012, I think it was, and about then, you know, um, I started working at my company university in 2007, and again, that was one year contracts, you know, and then get two in a row and then they laid me off, brought me back for a year, gave me another year's contract, you know, and then they added to that year. So I think MD would want, the MD would want to kind of work. I mean, I, I try and discourage most students from working academia, you know, I always say to them really, try and get, all I would say in terms of advice, try and get yourself a public sector job, because at least they're pensionable, you've got trade unions, and you might be able to kind of have some sort of kind of decent living off it, you know, private sector, as the place to stay away from, as far as I'm concerned. But I wouldn't necessarily kind of encourage them to go into or, or expect much out of kind of working as a scholar, you know, working in a, in a university, really. I don't know if that answers your question, Susan. That's but, good, um, thank you. Yeah, that's fine. There wasn't a real right answer to this. <laughs> I was just probing you. <laughs> okay. Can I ask a, another one here on behalf of John? Um, what's the difference between the Belfast Glasgow anarchists of today? Have they stood still or fallen back? Uh, it's a, it's trust John to ask the hardest question of all. Uh, <laughs> um, that's a really difficult one to ask because times are so kind of different. Um, and each generation of anarchists has had, they've had their own particular kind of challenges, both in Glasgow and in Belfast, to kind of deal with. You know, Glasgow in the 1970s was in no way dealing with the same sort of challenges that Belfast was dealing with, with the death toll, with the bombings, with the kind of madness, you know, and all that sectarianism that was, that, that surrounded them, you know, that, that really complicated getting involved in, in, in any sort of kind of, you know, left-wing politics, never mind um, anarchist revolutionary politics. So um, I think in some ways, it's a bit of a flinch, I suppose, but I kind of think in some ways they have both. Um, well, I don't think they've stood still. I think they definitely have kind of changed and anarchism has had to adopt like any other kind of political kind of movement to the challenges of, you know, an increasingly kind of precarious workforce, you know. Um, 
uh, nature of employment's changed. We've got the kind of gig economy that's emerged, you know, um, challenge posed by the kind of so-called surveillance society, um, environmental challenges, all these things that, that weren't, if they were around, they weren't um, thought about maybe as much by earlier kind of generations of kind of anarchists. So it has had to kind of, um, standing still has never been an option, I don't think, at any time for anarchists. Um, I don't think it's necessarily kind of fallen back. And I mean, if you look at the kind of rise of anarchism and, you know, people's conception of what anarchism is, I think for most of its history, anarchism has been fighting a propaganda war against the right and against statists um, and often against the left um, who have done their damnest really to try and undermine the idea of anarchism, you know. Um, and to establish in people's minds something that it's not. Um, and I think really, certainly in the last 30 years, that has changed. Um, certainly since Seattle and since the 1990s and stuff, you know, um, the rise of the anti-capitalist movement globally, I think um, people are much more, much more aware of what anarchism is rather than what it is not, if you like, you know, the, the sort of um, deliberate, sort of um, manipulation, if you like, around the ideas of anarchy and anarchism are, are less successful maybe nowadays than, than they were in the past. So I think that's a positive thing that has, that has kind of changed. So I don't, you know, I don't know that it has fallen back. Anarchists certainly maybe have less purchase in traditional industries that they would have had in the past, but those sort of traditional skilled sort of kind of industrial workforces have declined as well. And obviously we're kind of facing a society, particularly Britain and Ireland, where the service sector economy dominates. Fewer people work manufacturing. Um, there's a lot of people working in telecommunications. You know, um, the fact that even some of myself and from my background work in university, I think, shows how the workforce has kind of changed in a sense, really, you know. Um, so, um, so no, I don't, I wouldn't say it's fallen back really it's just changed the territory this you know the kind of the battleground has changed a little bit really you know the aims kind of remain the same and stuff and anarchists just need to be able to be able to kind of ad adopt that I just find I find it hard sometimes myself you know because you kind of carry the baggage you work in a university you know and all this notion of kind of being an academic it's very hard in some ways to kind of feel yourself you know, in the same place as someone who's a courier worker, or, you know, <laughs> um, even if you've had a precarious employment history and all the rest of it, and you've got kind of shared things and all the rest of it, it, is, I, it still is a bit difficult. I kind of find that a bit difficult sometimes, really, you know, in terms of kind of my own activism, really. Um, you know, you could understand people saying, well, who the fuck are you as an academic to be telling me you've got a good job, you've got secure employment, you know? Um, and, and, and academia comes with its own kind of middle-class status, you know what I mean? Um, so I find that a difficult thing to kind of, to deal with and to try and overcome a lot of the time, to be honest, you know? Mm -hmm. um, but, so that's one of the challenges that I face. I mean, I'm still kind of active and, and, and try to be as active as I can, participate kind of struggles all the time. But um, but I'm always, a f I'm, I'm kind of, it's important not to, not to kind of forget what your own kind of status and kind of background is sometimes, you know. Um, which again is a bit of rambling <laughs> sort of explanation, I think, maybe. Or, um, can I ask you just quickly another one about um, the Eric's asking about the impact of the troubles in Northern Ireland on Glasgow and especially the Catholic nationalist community? Can you say yeah. anything about that? Um, I can say a wee bit about it. I mean, um, the, the, I, I was involved recently in a kind of documentary um, BBC Scotland did um, on called The Trouble Next Door, I think it was called. Um, which was all about the impact more broadly of the the conflict in the north um, on Scotland. Now, obviously, um, like some of the people here would have grown up in a, in, in a kind of environment of the west of Scotland's own sectarianism and stuff and awareness. 
And I, and I always thought that kind of equipped me when I went to Northern Ireland. I always thought, oh, well, I know, you know, I understand the kind of sectarian politics. But actually, when I went to, when I came here to Northern Ireland, I get a bit of kind of rude awakening as to how it actually was, really, you know, and how much, how little I knew, really, you know, how much I didn't know. Um, so it's not really an area I've researched too heavily, um, but I'm kind of aware of bits and pieces. I mean, certainly, um, I suppose you would say many of the Catholic community in Scotland had a kind of traditional, because many of them were from an Irish had a traditional sort of sentimental, sentimental support maybe for um, for Irish national aspirations in one way or another, would have liked to have seen a United Ireland, you know, certainly my parents would have spoke about their their parents' generation and how they supported that and how, you know, you had family members that had been involved in the IRA in the 1920s and stuff like that, you know. So I grew up with a bit of that kind of tradition in my own family. But my parents were always kind of clear to separate that out from the provisional IRA of the 1970s, so it was a very different IRA then and now, you know, that type of thing. Partly because, you know, they were worried about, you know, about any of their kids getting involved in anything like that, I think, naturally. Mm -hmm. um, but also, I think, because, you know, we can, we can kind of look fondly and with nostalgia and kind of violent movements of the past sometimes. Um, but when it's happening around about you, it's a sort of kind of different matter. So I think there's kind of an element of that. Um, and a, an awful lot of Scotland's Catholic community, I suppose, um, you know, the kind of brutality of of the course of the conflict in the North um, put an awful lot of people off off it, really. Well, they might have had a set, still maintained a sentimental support, I think, um, for a United Ireland. Um, they, they, uh, they, they probably... Uh, would have been completely against the kind of means to achieve that, really, that the professional IRA um, were, were using, really. Um, I mean, there were there was a kind of wider impact in that there were always some supporters of the professional IRA, in particular at high points like Bloody Sunday, obviously, here in Derry. Um, obviously, um, when, when people were kind of killed and there was a kind of rise in anger and kind of agitation and about things like that, you know, various atrocities. Um, conducted by the state, in which people then would kind of feel, you know, I'm going to, I'm going to align with, with, um, going to align with, with Republicans in one way or another. So there was always kind of an element of that amongst the Irish community in Scotland, um, and um, there was an IRA unit um, in, in Glasgow, like there were in many British cities, um, like Liverpool and Manchester, Birmingham and London. Um, right up until 1972 um, or 73 when there was a stash of explosives found in Glasgow in a Catholic um, parochial house and a number of people were arrested and the Catholic priest um, Father Burns fled to the Republic of Ireland and that led to a kind of clamp down in a lot of ways and, and the provisional IRA decided that it was going to closed down its units in Britain and, and after that they would only send people across from Ireland itself to get involved in, in, in sort of attacks in one way or another, obviously as part of the, the bombing campaign um, in England. Scotland. Do you think, Wales, do you think that had any influence on the Scottish Republican movement at the time and the letter bomb campaigns and stuff like that? Um, well, I think a lot of them were kind of inspired in many ways, if that's the right word, um, by by the Republican activities in Scotland, and they kind of shared a similar broadly nationalist um, agenda in one way or another. Um, regardless of the fact of whatever kind of politics individually some of those people might have had in terms of left-right spectrum, and you know a lot of people that have been involved in it probably had kind of left-wing politics, but um, but the 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 primate. The, the primary name was always a kind of simply kind of nationalist one, um, and um, there were linkages between the two. I mean, I think most Scottish Republicans 
tended to link up more with the Irish National Liberation um, Army, the INLA, and its political wing, the Irish Republican Socialist Party, from the kind of late 70s into the early 80s, um, because they thought they were more left wing in one way or another, um, or more left of centre, certainly, than the provisionals, who tend to be more, much more kind of traditional, or seen as much more traditionally nationalist and kind of Catholic um, organisation or, or movement, really, you know. Mm -hmm. um, Plus, I think the provisionals themselves were always wary of Scotland in, in some ways as well, because Scotland, and the west of Scotland in particular, had its own kind of sectarian baggage. Loyalism in Scotland had a big following. Um, so, you know, it's always my perception, strangely enough, that, and I heard this from Republicans in Glasgow, that they always tended to, well, they opposed the Prevention of Terrorism, for example, Prevention of Terrorism Act, as an assault on civil liberties and, you know, increased powers for the state, repressive powers for the state. At the same time, they didn't publicly campaign too much on it because they felt that actually it was mostly loyalists who were going to be on the receiving end of it in Scotland. Um, which is quite a kind of cynical attitude to take. I was kind of shocked when I first heard that. But um, so, you know, amongst themselves, they were opposed to it, obviously. But um, in terms of activism, a lot of the time they stood back a little bit because he thought, well, it's those ones that are going to get dealt with in relation to it, like, you know, right. so, so that's another, um, another kind of factor in it, I suppose, you know. Um, I think Deck wants to come in with a question. Right. I think Deck was wanting to come in with a question. Yeah, um, yeah, I think that was a really, really good talk. I mean, this year I myself had to cover a hundred years uh, very very rapidly in a public meeting um, and it's 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 scary scary stuff to try and cover that kind of uh, that kind of uh, period in, in a short in a short thing um what I want to kind of ask or what what like springs to mind in a sense is uh, about anarchists and anarchist or libertarian socialist organization uh, and organizational continuity and the differences between Ireland and Scotland, uh, or particularly the North. Uh, now, in the interwar years, certainly, Scotland seemed to have a really strong sense of the need for formal uh, anarchist organisations or libertarian socialist organisations with agreed politics. Um, so you've got the APCF, the anti-panties, you've got your United Socialist Movement, and you've got the Anarchist Communist Federation, which is obviously a lot smaller. But even like some of the, the, the Sternerists, the Sternerites, you know, they orientated towards syndicalism. And I think that, you know, that's on, as you said, just that's really unusual. Uh, um, but it's probably because of their working class uh, orientation. Um, now, in that same period, nothing was really possible in Ireland because of the, the way that the, you know, the, the, there were so few anarchists on the ground. Having an organisation would have been fairly phantomic, if that's a real word. Um, and then uh, there's no national Irish anarchist organisation, really, national organisation, until the 1970s, I think. I might be wrong here. Uh, the Anarchist Workers Association, which again I think was mainly in Dublin, uh, around Alan McSamoin. Um and uh, then realistically on the national basis, I suppose the Workers Solidarity Movement in the, in the 1980s, mid 1980s, right? And there's a continuity they still exist and so forth. And in the north. <laughs> There's nothing really at all until the, the mid 1980s, uh, and the organised group uh, it emerges in, in Balamina, and and then is is sort of like extended to, to Belfast and stuff. Um, at, but it seems that like in the same period, if you like, from the end of the Second World War up until quite recently, or even today, really. Um, Scotland has not been particularly at the forefront of national organisation or, or the idea of having like a uh, national organisation. So the, uh, the Syndicalist Workers Federation, which would have been the biggest anarchist type organisation, 
in the 1950s and into the 60s and so forth it didn't I may be wrong here again I may be wrong but didn't seem to have a, a, a large sort of following in Scotland solidarity uh, the libertarian socialist organization did have a kind of a, a certain presence here um, and then you had a, a very short-lived Scottish Federation of Anarchists in the 1990s, which some of the people mm -hmm. participating today were actually a part of. So, you know, why do you think maybe Ireland has uh, become more of a, a, a pro-organisation kind of um, movement, if you like, for want of a better word? It seems to me that um, the Irish anarchists have tended not to orientate towards local groups so much. I mean, they have. They've got the dairy anarchists and so forth, right? But there's always like this sort of motivation, it seems to me, to be something more, to actually coordinate something bigger and to have uh, an organisational form that, that is suited to the, the, the environment. So any thoughts on that? Yeah. I'd love to hear them. Uh, <laughs> big question I think um, uh, I think um, to be honest I think the kind of main reason behind it is the fact that in Ireland the left has always been a marginal force as I kind of mentioned you know even from the roots in the 19th century the national question completely dominated and I think because of that in some ways it forced the left because they were in that marginal position to try and consolidate themselves a bit more, you know, whereas the left was much more vibrant, um, had greater variety and so on, and, and Scotland, England, Wales, um, that in a sense, it was much more difficult maybe to kind of unite all those kind of various disparate elements really, you know, whereas if you were in the left in Ireland at all, you know, you had few friends really, you know, <laughs> and, and um, uh, although, you know, the various, you know, at various times you had elements within nationalism and elements within unionism that claimed sort of kind of left wing ideas um, and, and sometimes formed sort of left wing organisations in one way or another, tried to influence trade unions in, in one direction or another. Um, the fact is really that the, the left itself was, was, was quite was quite weak, really, you know, um, and I think that really probably forced it into trying to assume better organisational coherence of the type that you're talking about there, really, you know. Um, whereas, you know, I don't, I, so many kind of traditions um, within Britain, really, that I think people were more, in, more inclined to kind of plough their own kind of furrow, you know, that kind of way. Um, thinking that all these different flowerings, they use the kind of mouse term, would kind of feed into each other, like you know. So, I guess that's I don't know if that's what's an answer, but that would be my get not my guess on it, to be honest, really. You know, but it's the nature of the kind of left in general, the nature of kind of revolutionary politics within that as well, really. You know, maybe sure, yeah. Um, I do you want to come back, Dick? Or? No, I mean, like, I don't, I don't have a, uh, an answer myself. I mean, that seems like a fairly uh, realistic one, I guess. Um, yeah, I mean, I think, like, possibly one of the reasons why, in a sense, uh, like, I don't think the, the tradition of Sternerite individualism has, has had a major impact on, on Scottish anarchism since the 1940s anyway um you know i don't think that's that's the issue so i've always kind of wondered why that relatively speaking scotland's not had that kind of uh national organization tradition so so much there is an element of obviously um but yes so i i think it is the, the particular circumstances in which people find themselves i think you know what's i mean there's always been kind of a in a strange way, an East Coast, West Coast thing going on in, in Ireland as much as there is in, in, in uh, well, maybe not 
quite as much, but in terms of anarchism uh, as well, you know, the difference between the kind of dairy side and the, and the Belfast side and so forth. But there always seems to be this, or you know, in, in the in the latter period, certainly since the, since the 80s, it's always been a kind of a sense of if anarchists are doing something, then they need to like reach out to other anarchists and they need to like build uh, organizations. They need to like actually have formal organizational uh, links and so forth. But yeah. Mm, I think it's probably oh. easier when there's fewer OVs in some probably. ways. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, yeah. For a long time, and it's still probably the case now, everybody kind of knows each other. Yeah. Know? There was, there was certainly a time in the 90s in the north that I think it was more or less the same people, but they changed the names of the organisations <laughs> on a regular basis. Um, but, you know, the, there was still continuity, and that's one of the fantastic things, is there is still continuity uh, with the organisation that you're a part of um, and the organisation that was established in the 1980s, you know. Mm -hmm pretty much you know there's a, a sense of it being the same and and the some of the same people and, and so forth uh, and people can kind of look back on that and think about you know what was you know what's possible then and what's possible now and so forth but yeah mm -hmm. good uh, thanks for that cheers uh keith do you know what um uh, Mirella and Ariane's question was yeah, I can, uh, <coughs> excuse me, I can uh, say it if you want. It's, uh, I just need to bring up, uh, basically it was about connections in either Belfast or Glasgow to unemployed movements. Right. Okay. Um, I, I mean, uh, I'm not too certain about that. Obviously the main unemployed sort of organisation in the nineteen thirties, you know, which was the biggest thing of the twentieth century was the National Unemployed Workers um, Association. Um, and uh, they tended to be pretty much kind of controlled by the the um, Communist Party of Great Britain. Um, so and they so obviously kinda of imposed and controlled that to a certain um, extent really you know but people would have kind of come into the organization with a kind of variety of kind of views left-wing and otherwise presumably um through that that kind of period which would have made it more difficult for, for them to kind of control in a sense there's also a kind of range of kind of local um unemployed organizations as well in that period from 1930s onwards um that emerged um i mean here in Derry in the 1930s it, but research that did in the unemployed, there's something like four or five different um, organisations, um, and the people involved with them have a kind of variety of kind of politics, um, and uh, so within that, um, there's a possibility, obviously, of kind of anarchist um, involvement. I suspect, but haven't found kind of final proof of really yet that, for example. James Campbell here in Derry, who went with the National Brigade to fight in Spain, uh, who I mentioned, was arrested for Trotsky's anarchist sympathies um, and imprisoned uh, by the Stalinists. He, he, I suspect he was involved with the Derry Unemployed Workers Movement, um, who were involved in a kind of series of very direct actionist organisation, but like in kind of Belfast. Um, took part in, in, in occupations of workhouses to kind of demand better kind of payments at that time because people were still being paid here in Northern Ireland out of the poor relief, the old poor law, really, you know, of the 19th century um, uh, because the, the, um, the insurance kind of payments, the kind of national insurance for unemployed um, people was, was so bad and was so inadequate, really, you know. Um, and protest marches and, and, and public speaking and stuff like that, you know. So a lot of those people would have learned their politics actually through through their activism as much as anything else. Um, I'm not so sure. I mean, I remember reading many years ago the kind of oral history collections, two books of the, um, that were done um, by McDougall and someone else on the, on the Scottish unemployed workers. Um, um, and I've never come across a crossover yet between the anarchist movement in, in Glasgow, certainly, and the 
the unemployed workers in Scotland. It may have been that it was more tightly controlled by the CP. Um, but still, you would imagine that there must have been people there involved with it who, who, um, who you know, who had anarchist politics or who were common to anarchist politics, particularly because that period of national unemployed workers' movement in the 1930s runs into the, the emergence of the Spanish Revolution and stuff. So you're getting a kind of growing awareness of anarchism. And I would imagine that um, there was some sort of kind of crossover. Then you've got unemployed movements again in the 50s. Um, and again, um, there might have been, because of the kind of rise in um, militancy and, and, um, and, and a lot of workplaces, you would have imagined, with the, with the apprentice strike and things like that, there might have been a growing interest in, in anarchist ideas because there were anarchist activists involved with that, like people like Bobby Lyon and so on, you know, I don't know. That's the honest answer. Um, Ian, did you want to come back in? Yes, um, this is about something you said earlier when you were mentioning um, that um, sort of you know, anarchism had a bad press and we systematically distorted, but that seemed to change um, around the 90s. And I was wondering whether that was the impact of the internet, because obviously um, anarchists were, and anarchist groups were quite one of the first in the left to actually see the potential and have web pages and so forth and actually conquer an online presence. Um, but since obviously the internet, um, in terms of the amount of information available, in terms of debunking um, you know, attacks and sort of presenting actual factual case, it's a lot easier now, I would imagine, than in the past. Um, because obviously, you know, you say a piece at a public meeting, the only people who would hear you in that public meeting would be the people there. Now you can potentially count you know, across anybody in the world. Um, similarly, you know, so many texts and archives available now, you can just put a link in and say, well, this is what we think, this is what was argued, go and look at this, this is the facts. Um, obviously, so my question is, um, do you think, do, overall, has the internet been a good thing for, um, you know, sort of scholarship, or has it been flooded by um, pranks, weirdos, conspiracy theories, and pornography? <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, it's come with its own baggage, hasn't it? I mean, I, I always, it was always my impression. I, I think you're kind of right, the anarchists were very kind of quick to get on to it for a start. I think part of that is because, you know, there was a kind of generation almost of anarchist workers who worked in, in sort of telecommunications, broadly speaking. I know an awful lot of comrades, people like Andrew Flood and that, and the Workers' Solidarity Movement in, in Dublin. Uh, an awful lot of the, the early kind of activists there in the 90s, they were working in that, in that sector, you know. They worked in web-based industries in one way or another. Um, and maybe that helped, um, you know, counter an awful lot of the arguments that were, that were there. People, because they kind of worked in that environment, you know, um, they had a better grip of the technology and stuff. Um, I, I think... I think in some ways it's a bit of a historian's answer, but it's a bit too early to tell in terms of the internet, I think, really. Um, it's pluses and minuses, really. Um, uh, because, there are, you know, when you tend, you know, the public debate about it certainly is about the downside of the internet, really, a lot of the time, you know. Um, but it has enabled a sort of kind of a virtual brotherhood and sisterhood really hasn't it internationally there's no doubt about that really you know it's connected people that formerly were were, were barely if connected at all uh, on different continents which united kind of struggles it's, an, it's certainly enabled solidarity work I mean I know just here in Derry I mean we're sort of you know it's a smallish town and the kind of west of Ireland sort of you know in the, on the fringes of Europe <laughs> um, and yet it's a place that has you know, prided itself on its sense of solidarity with people and kind of struggles globally. Um, and an awful lot of that has been facilitated by the kind of revolution in kind of communications technology going way back to the kind of 60s, you not know, even just kind of, of recent years. You know, the, the, certainly a lot of the linkages were made with kind of black civil rights, with the kind of struggle of kind of, um, you know, student protests in Europe. Um, of the kind of Vietnamese and stuff like all, all of those kind of struggles that kind of emerged in the 1960s. So solidarity actions here in, in Derry. And it was because of things like the telly. It was like TV had, had sort of in its own time revolutionized that. It made people 
see other people and struggle physically and struggle with the state, you know, and with the forces uh, of reaction. And it kind of led people to kind of make connections with the objective kind of conditions they were living in, um, uh, and, and to make those connections with other people, you know, and to think, um, if you like, horizontally rather than in the traditional Irish way, which is vertically, you look back, you look to the past rather than across the world, really, you know. And I think that that was one of the great kind of transformations, really, of, of the kind of 60s period, much maligned as it is in a lot of ways, you know. And, and I would expect, although it took a long time for that to kind of maybe filter through, I think that you can already see that the benefits of the internet I think, or hopefully vastly out, outweigh the, the negative um, aspects of it. I mean, we're all here for a start, you know, so. <laughs> I know. Any more yeah. contributions or questions? Oh, well, well, will we bring it to a close then? Um, did you want to say anything else, Martin? No, I just want to say thanks to everybody for um, for coming along and listening to me. Um, Again, a very rambling and incoherent <laughs> um, talk at times. Um, it's kind of like I always say when um, at least I enjoyed myself. Uh, it's always good to get kind of talk about these things, like you know, <laughs> even if nobody else did. Um, but I hope it was of some. I hope everybody got a little bit of something out of it, you know. Um, in one way or another, um, even in terms of just of the, the questions, which are kind of varied and kind of interesting. Um, but uh, it's been good just to kind of, it's always kind of good to kind of revisit your kind of past and look at the traditions that we kind of come from, really, you know, and that we need to kind of keep popularising, you know. Um, history's not of any use if it's not a mobilising force, you know what I mean? It's no museum piece. Um, I mean, you can see that with a kind of, you know, the kind of toppling of statues of these various nefarious characters all over the world, you know, um, and the iconoclasm that kind of goes with, that goes with that, you know, it's history is something that's in the here and now, it's kind of lived, it's part of, it's part of the fibre of who we are, you know, and so, you know, it's great to get a chance to, to talk about it and make connections with people, um, uh, hopefully before long we'll be able to make meet face to face like you know i know i know and well, struggle I feel as if we've just uh, skimmed the surface there's so much in that no uh, there is there's a lot to cover all right i sure is no just just say thanks to everybody you know uh-huh we appreciate it yeah well thanks to you for doing all this um no. keith for uh hosting and iww for technical support um, and all the volunteers at Spirit of Revolt. So thanks everybody for coming. I don't know if you want to stay on and have an informal chat <laughs> or if we just want to close. Keith? I, don't mind. I have to say it's nice to talk to people because I haven't seen anybody for a year. I, know. So, you know. <laughs> I haven't seen you for ages and I haven't seen Mary.